From you? Yeah, that's one shot. Man. Be my guest, you go. So Anthony, it's lovely to meet you. And uh, you. In the wonderful Waterstones in Norwich, we have a little guest here with us. I cannot tell you how knocked out I am by what Waterstones Norwich have done for me and for the book. It's just fantastic. I've done a lot of shops and a lot of uh, talks around the country in the last couple of weeks, but this one already outshines them all. Well, this is all courtesy of the absolutely wonderful Debs, who's just, she's around somewhere, but she has put all this together and we are absolutely gobsmacked. She should take a bow at the end of this film. Honestly, she's, she's wasted. We need her for set design at Mustard TV, I'm sure. You're here for the signing of Magpie Murders. Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, well, it's a whodunit. In fact, it's two whodunits in one. Uh, two for the price of one, you might say. Uh, the first half of it is set in the 1950s and is a very Agatha Christie-style murder mystery with a detective called Atticus Punt who is solving a crime in a village, as, as one does. Um, but after 160-odd pages, something rather odd happens. You reach a blank page just before the identity of the killer is revealed. And the reason for this is that the author of Magpie Murders, who is not me, but a, a writer called Alan Conway, sure. has himself died. And he has died before he has delivered the entire manuscript. And the second half of the book starts in a London editing house, a publisher, where an editor is sent to the home of, of, of Alan Conway, the writer, to find the missing chapter. And she discovers, first of all, that Alan Conway was himself murdered. And secondly, the secret of who killed him may be contained in the manuscript of Magpie Murders. If that sounds complicated, it is a bit, but actually when you read it, it's far simpler. Trying to describe it to friends of mine who are wondering what I'm reading at the minute is the most difficult thing, <laughs> but well, it really is the it whodunit is, to end all whodunits. It, well, in a sense, that is what it is. And it's also a book about whodunits because the editor, Susan Ryland, publishes whodunits. She's very interested in the whole nature of why we like whodunits and why we read them and, and the, the, the relationship between the reader, the detective and the writer, which is another thing which is explored inside this book. Let's talk a little bit about whodunits, because we've explored a lot. We've talked about Agatha Christie, who is a pioneer of whodunits. I myself have never been able to commit myself to an Agatha Christie novel, but obviously the classics still exist. They are still recreated. Sophie Hannah's doing Poirot at the mm -hmm. minute, which I can never pronounce. Poirot. No, you would it absolutely right. Poirot, Poirot, I think, Poirot. yes. Do you think that if an Agatha Christie novel was around today, like newly fresh on the bookshelves, they would be as successful? What a very, very interesting question. I mean, part of the answer is that they are still that successful. I mean, she still sells fantastic quantities of books. And as you correctly said, I mean, her books are being continued by Sophie Hanna. They're being filmed again. The BBC recently put out, and then there were none, very beautifully. They're doing, I think, seven or eight more now. Agatha Christie is as popular now as she always was. The question is, if she was writing now for the first time, would she still be as successful? It's almost impossible to say, really. I suspect so, because even if you don't like the books yourself, and that's reasonable enough, I mean, lots of people balk at the sort of the language and the sort of, the, the sort of superficiality of them, they are still wonderful puzzles. They are still extraordinarily clever, twisty stories. And I think that the answer is that yes, I think she quite probably would be as popular it's interesting, though, would she still continue to write about villages and about that sort of rather old-fashioned life, or would she bring it bang up to dates with, you know, mobile phones and the internet and all the rest of it? Quite interesting. In fact, the next book I'm going to write is going to look at something rather similar to that. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, colour me intrigued. This is exciting. <laughs> it's fair to say that there is a, quite, there is a formula to writing a, a novel that is a crime fiction. Do you find, as a crime writer, when you are reading a crime novel, that you can guess quite early on what is going on? Um... I do usually guess, not always, I sometimes, guess. I sometimes I guess, uh, but not always. Um, and I don't want to guess. I mean, I like to be baffled. I like to get to the end. I think uh, the, the rule of a good whodunit is that you get to the end without guessing, but when the secret is revealed, you kick yourself. And that, I think, is what I've achieved in a way with Magpie moment. Murders, because mm. as I've said to you, the, the secret or one of the motives of one of the murders and the identity of the killer is actually guessable from the first page of the book. But this is something I have said before, and so far, although people who've finished the book have agreed that it is just about possible to guess, nobody yet has. And the funny thing is that you said something to me tonight, which was the solution to one of the murders. It you actually sure? came out of your lips. Oh, don't say that, because that, that sentence of 
the first three pages, it's solvable. It's the most frustrating thing for me to hear. I have <laughs> gone over them and over them. You, honestly, you're going to get so many tweets from me when I work this out. It's going to be... Because you are quite prolific on Twitter. You can, you, can send me, you can send me rude messages in 140 characters. Challenge accepted. I've got this. <laughs> One thing I did notice about the first three pages is you mentioned two very notable UEA graduates. You've got Rankin and Ishiguru. Obviously both very notable Norwich writers. And just to bring it back to Norwich very briefly, UEA has obviously been quite an established um, in the kind of literary field as churning out these wonderful writers. Is UBA still considered quite highly when it comes to creative writing? Oh, definitely. It's one of the great best courses in the world for that. And it's got a number of writers who have been extremely successful. Uh, and I think I even mentioned the, the, the course itself. Uh, I mentioned Arvon as well, which is a charity that teaches uh, writers and helps writers. And, uh, you know, the book is a little bit about writing and about what it's like to be a writer as well as being a whodunit. So, of course, I mentioned the course. But speaking of Sophie Hannah, she's been interested um, to write some Poirot novels. Uh -huh. You are the only person who has been entrusted with both Bond and Holmes. That's got to feel pretty special. Well, it, it does feel special because these are the two books or a series of books that I most loved when I was a child and you know they, they had a huge influence on me I mean Sherlock Holmes steered me towards um, writing crime fiction, Foyle's War, uh, Midsummer Murders and all the other crime that I've done uh, and James Bond of course is the father if you like of Alex Ryder um, and that inspired me to write a whole series of books for young people about a spy so these were books that I absolutely adored and relished when I was sort of 13, 14 years old and so to come to them all these years later as a continuous novel, given the blessing of both the Ian Fleming and the Conan Doyle estate, does feel good. Yes, I was very, very excited to be doing it. I'm very excited to be doing another Bond book, incidentally, uh, next year. I wouldn't do just any book. I mean, the continuation writing I love, but it, it, you know, there isn't another author I think you could ask me to do it for, but I would accept, including incidentally Agatha Christie. I'm very happy to leave that to Sophie Hanna. Uh, but, but certainly working with those two authors was something that was a, a, a fantastic pleasure for me. Unfortunately, I could honestly speak to you for hours, and I want to because I've got to pick your brains about Alex Ryder at some point. But we do have to wrap things up. Anthony Horowitz, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. And you too. Thank you for talking to Thank me. Thank you so much. <laughs>